It appears John Conyers district replaces one trailblazer with another. Rashida Talib is here this morning. Plus what last Tuesday's results tell us about November. Today is Sunday, August 12, 2018, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. Hope you're enjoying your weekend. Tuesday was a bit of a stunner. No, perhaps not in the results. Conventional wisdom seemed to suggest that the gubernatorial candidates would end up being Bill Schuette and Gretchen Whitmer, and that is exactly what happened. No, the surprise came in the number of voters that broke with the usual assumptions about midterm August primaries and got to the polls in droves. It was a turnout that we haven't seen since at least 1978. 27 percent of the state's registered voters. Now, I suppose I might also point out that means 73 percent of the state's registered voters did not vote, but by primary standards, it was quite a showing. And around here in our neck of the woods, uh, voters had to put up with polling places running out of ballots in some Oakland County precincts and power outages following the storms that hit the east side of the metro area. A couple of odd results to ponder, like people scrambling to ask, who is Betty Jean Alexander? With basically no campaign to speak of, no website, no signs, she managed to knock off incumbent State Senator David Knizik by nine points. How's that happen? Also, I had noted that the 13th Congressional District actually had two elections, and interestingly enough, voters split the two. Brenda Jones won the vote to fill out the remainder of John Conyers' term, but Rashida Tlaib won the full term to succeed Conyers. That makes for a sticky situation for Jones, who's the president of the Detroit City Council. But it also makes for what will almost certainly be the first Muslim woman elected to Congress. And Rashida Tlaib will be here in a few moments to talk about it. And our roundtable on what all of this means for November. All today on Flashpoint. Well, perhaps because it felt more like a general election than a primary election, one of the most closely watched matchups this past Tuesday night was the race in the 13th Congressional District. And when the dust cleared, the last woman standing was Rashida Tlaib, my first guest this morning. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, you're quite an American story, daughter of Palestinian immigrants. Uh, I'm curious as to what the family reaction has been first to what's happened. Uh, I still have my grandmother who's alive and well in the West Bank mm -hmm. and it's uh, been just life changing. I mean this is a, a small little village uh, right outside of Ramallah and uh, they you know they're from a farming community very working small working class family and they are just thrilled. I mean people are coming from all over the country and it's a very small yeah. country uh -huh. to come yeah. and congratulate and uh, they've had to buy a lot of baklava and to pass that out. and. Uh, my grandmother is thrilled uh, and I think my aunts and uncles uh, the things they've been saying to the Middle East like media outlets is I've always been this way and they're not surprised uh, which makes me so excited that's and nice uh, very the, thrilled. the way it uh, often goes though with people who are sort of pioneers in their field and you're going to become uh, the first Muslim woman to serve in Congress um, but I know sometimes people don't want to be put in that box they don't want to you know I'm not here as a Muslim woman uh, and yet that is very much a part of the fabric of who you are so how do you look I mean, at that part box. of this? I, it, Everything in the box is I'm a Detroiter, a woman of color, a mom, a Palestinian, a Muslim, all that is in the box. And I think it makes me the unique uh, public servant that I am. I mean, I approach things from the, all those lens altogether. I mean, I went to a school that's predominantly African American. I grew up in a community in Southwest Detroit was predominantly Latino and African American and white. I mean, it was it was incredibly uh, really reflective of what America's about. This mm -hmm, little mm -hmm. melting of just beautiful, beautiful different faiths and different ethnicities and colors of skin and uh, all those things that I think that are just make uh, this whole story even more incredible. But it also though makes it a really interesting time to show up in Washington. Yes, it is. <laughs> I'm glad you're smiling about no, that's, that's it because also, it looks like a pretty intense time yeah. to be in the swirl of those kind of debates, doesn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, so, so many of the people I talked to, they were still very much like this morning that happened, I think, after President Trump won and the sense that uh, they don't feel like he speaks for them, right? Um, they feel very much left out. A lot of the people that I even spoke to that were Democrats that did support him, uh, you know, regret it. Uh, they realize just how bad of a vote that was and how they can see they're still being left behind. They're not being included in these discussions. But you must also see that m the majority of the president's supporters are digging in. They are more committed to him than 
than ever, which really creates this very powerful divide that we have in the country right now. I don't think, you know, I don't think we're divided. Though. Really? I, I really think it's because we're just disconnected. I think that... There's, there might not be, there, there might be a big difference. Absolutely. That's an interesting way And it way was an African-American pastor in my district, Stephen Bland, who said that, and it resonated with me so powerfully. Not that, divided, but disconnected. He says that, and 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 I, it just resonated with me because after doing all those doors, when he said that in the church, I looked up and I said, "That's what's happening." Uh, and why that's important to say that when you see all the support is there's just a disconnection and I really think uh, me being there, me having a seat at the table is going to connect a lot of people uh, to those issues and challenges for mm -hmm. the families in the 13th. I've uh, spoken before to uh, congressional rookies yeah. about what was the surprise for them when they first arrive in Washington. Mm -hmm. um, I, I talked to one of them last week who's now been there a while and said that y the array of issues that in front of you is vast, mm -hmm. especially international relations. And I am curious about your thoughts about of uh, falling into that with particular focus on the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Yeah, uh, you know, I grew up in Detroit where every corner is a reminder of the Civil Rights Movement. Every um, uh, part of growing up you know, with a UAW Ford working father was something about the labor rights movement, this sense of that everybody deserves human dignity. And I come with that lens. I come with, you know, that lens of going to Palestine as a young 12, you know, I was 11, 12 year old mm -hmm. little girl. And I remember my mom being in a separate line. Uh, and even though she was born there, even though she was an American, she was in a separate line before she could actually enter the country to go see her mother and her, and her father at that time was living. And I remember my uncle having a different color license plate uh, compared to everybody else that may be a, a Israeli citizen. So for me, that's the lens I bring. I remember being 12 years old, me and my brothers going to this place that had a basketball court, not realizing it's a settlement, not realizing mm -hmm. that's an Israeli settlement because there was no walls. Literally, I mean, there was no fencing, no walls. There was an integration. There was a, still a sense of the possibility of connecting. Mm -hmm. And now you see the segregation has actually increased violence there. Uh, it's de dehumanizing. Um, the dehumanization of Palestinians has been really, really strong. Everybody, including Israelis, deserve to feel safe, it, Devin. And, uh, you know, again, those personal experiences is what I'm going to bring to Congress. It, it, but Israel has always been a powerful ally of the United States, if for no other reason than our shared sense of what a capitalist democracy, the power that that can bring uh, to people, to economies, to um, uh, to a nation. I'm curious, do you do you go to Washington, though, feeling like Israel is an enemy? You know, absolutely not. See, it's always this one or the other. I don't yeah. pick a side. I pick the human being side, the humanity side. Think about it. You think I don't understand fully how it feels like to be maybe Israeli and feel like every corner I might be attacked because of that or because of some leader that made that decision. Like, I hope people don't see me as Trump. Just like I am not going to see every Israeli citizen as Netanyahu, who has dehumanized, has violated international human rights. I would never do that. Over, overwhelmingly, so many of them support uh, that um, we need some sort of peace resolution. Now, I can tell you that, that when I talk to Israeli citizens, when I talk to Palestinian, uh, Palestinian Americans, even a family back home, uh, one of the things they want to do is be able to have access to a better quality of life. And that is something that all of them can come together on. And that's the discussions we're not having. It's like we're picking and choosing whether or not you're for that or for that. Why can't you feed for both? It's going to be pretty easy to got to be pretty easy to troll someone like you online, yes, and I know it's from already happening. You, you've seen from social media, <laughs> yeah. you're going to have to deal with a lot of questions about Sharia law and what it means as Muslims start to take hold in government positions. How do you generally deal with that? Through my actions. When I was the first Muslim woman ever elected in the Michigan legislature, I got all the hate mail. A good Muslim is a dead one. I mean, it was very, very painful, but at the same time just bet, stayed who I was. I mean, I fought back against billionaire Maddie Maroon when we tried to build a bridge in our backyard without any permitting. I stood up against corporate polluters. I do it through action. I feel like I expose my faith, Islam, in such a profound, powerful way through public service. I love that one of my residents came in one time and was like, she really Muslim because whatever challenges, stereotypical things she was going through, Devin, she wasn't it's being it. challenged. Oh, yeah. and that's a beautiful thing. And that's that's exactly the connection that's going to happen by me serving. The last thing I want to ask you, you are, are representing one of the poorest districts yeah. in the country. Uh, what do you want to deliver for them? I want to have a comprehensive Civil Rights Act. You know, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, got completely 
you know, devalued in many ways through the courts. And 55 years ago, the Civil Rights Act allowed us to push back against redlining, allowed us to push back in equity, in equity and funding mm -hmm. for education. All of that changed because now they, the courts are saying, and this is a stacked up, you know, with some conservative judges, many of them probably got a lot of corporate support, that you have to show intent, that, that it was intentional discrimination. Devin, policies right now that are in place, those structures, it's so hard to show intent. As an attorney, I can tell you, it's very difficult. It can take years before we show that pattern. Mm -hmm. But showing that the impact, impact of itself, the use of redlining, impacts communities of color, that's going to transform people's lives. But you know that you'll also hear from some that say, look, this district has been represented by a, a liberal Democrat for a long time, and that it hasn't it hasn't gotten the people of that district very far. Yeah, you know, my approach is a little bit different, and it's a new era, right? I believe, and that's kind of set me apart from my colleagues, creating neighborhood service centers throughout my district, I want to create three of them, one in Detroit, one in Down River, and one in um, Western Wayne, is there are resources now that many of my residents don't even know about. Uh, no. the, the, these are resources they need now, helping how to become a first home buyer, all those things. I'm going to fight for Medicare for all, but they shouldn't wait to get access to health care until I pass that bill. There are ways that I can push really hard and fight for them to get access. Got to wait, of course, until November, until it's all yes. formal. But we expect this is the newest member of Congress from Detroit, Rashida yes. Tlaib. Thanks Thank for being so here much. this morning. Thank Congratulations. We'll bring the roundtable in. This is Flashpoint on Local 4.